Hi everyone, thanks for joining the webinar. So today uh, we're going to be doing a webinar on Bluebeam tips and tricks um, with the idea to enhance your workflow. My name's Alex Butcher, I'm the Technical Sales Manager at AST, um, a Bluebeam certified instructor. We've been a Bluebeam partner for been around 20 years now or so, um, and we're a Bluebeam Platinum partner. I need to update my slides <laughs> um, for the Australia New Zealand region. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to cover off a few different topics. Um, we're going to do just some general tips and tricks, um, working with some different functionality in Bluebeam. So um, we're going to start with uh, profiles and toolbars, um, a bit around navigation and, and some tips to, to make speed up your workflow with navigating around documents, uh, markup and measurement tools. We're going to look at document comparison, and then we'll touch on batch hyperlinking as well. Uh, we should have some time at the end, around 15 minutes for question Q and A, Q and question and answers as well. So, if you have any questions as we're going through, um, at the end I will open up so that everyone has the opportunity to unmute themselves and ask questions if you need to. As we're going through, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, or there is also a Q and A tab, and um, we have a couple of people um, who will be able to um, answer them. Uh, Travis just said that there is an echo at his end. Has anyone else got an echo? If if there is, can you put it in the chat? Might be me. Could be someone else. Cool. Might be you. Sorry, Trevor. You might have to just restart your audio. Um, Cool, okay, let's get into it. So just a quick um, little introduction on AST. Um, we're a software, hardware and services um, uh, company. Uh, we're a technology solution provider. Um, some of the things that we do and provide is obviously Bluebeam. Um, we're an Autodesk Gold partner, an Adobe Gold reseller, um, Microsoft ESET uh, of antivirus and protection. Um, we have a hardware um, business where we provide hardware that suits obviously the solutions we provide um, for HP, Dell and Lenovo. Um, we have a services division who do things like customizations of software um, for the Autodesk platform, um, Bluebeam as well, um, and different sort of drafting services and things like that. We also have a, a facilities management services um, division of business as well. Um, so if you have any questions about those um, parts of the business, please reach out to us anytime. Where can you find help for Bluebeam? So you can reach out to us at support at advancedspatial.com.au, which will create a ticket and someone will get back to you um, internally here. Uh, you can always give us a call, 1300 672 And um, if it's urgent, it'll get passed to one of our support agents for, for quick assistance as well. Um, inside Bluebeam, if you go to the help menu and then the help guide, um, there are some really useful resources in there, which I'll show you really quickly once we get into Bluebeam as well. Um, and <clears throat> everyone now on subscription also has access to Bluebeam University, um, which is a, a self-paced training course, which you can access online, um, also through the help menu um, from within, within Review as well. So anyone that has an active subscription um, with Review 21 will have access to Bluebeam University now as well. Cool. So let's jump into Bluebeam, get into the tips and tricks. So like I said, if you have any questions as we go through, please pop them in the chat. Um, I'm going to go through things relatively fast. There's a few people online who should be able to help answer the questions as well. And if not, I'll get to them at the end as well. Um, if there's any, if the uh, everyone online who's reading the questions wants to answer live as well, if you just pop that in there, we'll answer them at the end. So cool. So what we're looking at here should be basically the default screen of Bluebeam. So I'm just going to touch on a few different things to help um, customizing it and things like that, profiles and toolbars and everything like that. We'll just go through just quickly what everything's called, um, just to give you a bit of an idea as I'm going to refer to a few different things as we go through today. So left-hand side here is called the panel access with all of your different panels, um, access to your tools, measurement tools, all that kind of stuff. Um, top bar here is called the menu bar, and it drops down and has all the different menus um, with, again, access to all the different tools and functions that we can use in Bluebeam. On the right-hand side here, we've got a couple of toolbars. Um, these two are the default toolbars that come turned on. With I've customized these a little bit to turn on some different tools. Um, and the bottom bar here is called the navigation bar. 
So the first thing we're going to go through is just a bit about setting this up so that it's a bit easier for you. So the idea is to customize this and change it as you need it so that you know, you're not looking for tools all the time and you have access to the tools you need um, quickly and easily. So all of these panels on the, right, on the left hand side here um, can be turned on and off. So if I right click them, I can hide them. I'm going to get rid of a few that I'm not going to use today. Oh. Some of these I might turn back on as we go as well, but we'll see how we go. Um, cool. So just try and keep it nice and simple um, so we don't have sort of too many icons. We're not having to look through things all the time. Um, these toolbars on the right hand side, we can also customize these. So we can turn these on and off. We can turn on more toolbars as well. Under tools up here, we've got toolbars. Um, there's a whole list of default toolbars. The two we've got turned on on the right there are the shapes and the text toolbar. The top one is the text one, the bottom one is the shapes one. Um, if I go to customize down here, I can customize those existing toolbars. So, for example, if I go to the text one, you'll see all these functions that are in here are also sitting in the toolbar here. So, for example, if I don't want the eraser turned on or the typewriter, I can turn those off or camera, for example. Um, I can turn those functions off. I can also just completely delete them from the toolbar if I want to as well. And then I can also add more functions to the toolbar too. So if I go to the text category, for example, uh, let's say oh, there's no text category. Let's go with um, edit. Let's say I want to put cut in there. I can hit the little arrow and then it adds that across into my toolbar. And once I hit apply, you should see that toolbar now update so that um, it, it yeah, reflects what I've just made changes with. You can also create your own toolbars as well under this little plus button here. You can call it whatever you want. Um, I've already got one in there called Alex's toolbar, so I'm just going to leave it as that. So if I go in here, I can add whatever functions I want into here as well. Um, when I'm creating toolbars, my tip would be just to go to the all category at this every single function that can be added in there in alphabetical order. It's a lot easier to find the functions in here instead of going to the categories and trying to find what category relates to a tool because some of them could go in multiple. So um, just makes your life a lot easier. Just have a look through here, find the tools you want. Hit that little add button, apply, and OK. When you turn on more toolbars, they should generally pop up up the top there. So if I turn on my toolbar, it pops up up the top here um, and it will list those as well. Yeah, you should see these little dotted lines above the top of a toolbar as well. If I click and drag that, I can move that across into different toolbars. When you are doing this as well, it's a little bit of an interesting process. See it pops things down and up and down. You kind of just got to hold it there until it gets there eventually. Um, if you want to lock those in place, if you just right click in the toolbar there, you can go to lock down here as well. And that locks them and all those little lines just disappear. Um, or if I want to unlock them and move them back, I can do that as well. So I'm going to pop these just back on the side because that's where I like those. Okay, cool. These panels as well, um, there's a few different spots that they can be. So they sit in the left by default. If I click and drag them across to the right, I can drop them on that right hand side and they sit over there. I can also right click them and detach them. So if I've got two screens, for example, I can put all my panels on one screen so I don't have to sort of click and change them all the time. I can sit them all on one screen and just use them from there. Um, I prefer to generally keep it on one screen. Generally, if you've got a big enough screen, it works better to have everything on one screen so you're not sort of having to switch screens all the time. Um, but yeah, it's sort of a personal preference thing. If you are having things on opposite sides, what I recommend is usually to have uh, things that you would use at the same time on opposite sides. So for me, I put the properties on one side and I keep everything else on the other side because I customize properties of things a lot. So it um, just helps that whenever I use a function from the left, the properties always pop up for it on the right straight away for me. Cool. Oh. So when you customize things, turn things on and off like that, obviously you don't want to have to do that every time you launch the software. That would be an absolute nightmare. So if I go to review up the top here, I can go to profiles um, and I can go to manage profiles down here and I can create my own. So if I go down here, I'll just call this webinar. Hit OK, and it just saves everything that we've just changed into that profile. Um, you'll see, obviously, I've got quite a few different profiles in here. Um, the top three are built in ones so review, review, advance, and quantitative takeoff. Um, you may also have field issues if you've had an older version of Bluebeam um, that's sort of come up to the newer versions. It's not one that's in the newer versions anymore. Um, and then all of these are just other ones that I've created or some sent me or whatever 
So um, if I go back to review, for example, you should see everything that we've just changed go back to default, how it was when we started today. And then if I go back to my webinar one, it goes back to normal. So the idea of creating profiles, um, there's a couple of different ways you can go about it. What most companies like to do is standardize profiles across their business. So um, one person sets up a profile with all the tools that um, people within their teams would use, um, and then we can export the profile. So if I go to manage profiles down here, select the profile, I can export it. Um, you could send that to someone in an email, put it on a shared drive where everyone can access it or however you share your files, um, and then someone just needs to double click it and it will import it for you. Um, you can also push that out with the deployment of the software as well um, for like larger organizations where you're deploying it. Um, it can go straight out when you install the software, so you don't need to import it or anything like that. Um, one thing that's really important, if you do make any changes to your profile, let's say I turn on some more toolbars, let's say I turn on the status bar, for example, which I would highly recommend for anyone who doesn't have that turned on. Um, whenever you do make some changes, just go into uh, profiles and then save profile and that will just save any of the changes that you do make. Cool, so that's just a quick overview of profiles, toolbars, and everything like that. Um, next bit we're gonna go through is a bit about navigating. So down the bottom here, we've got what's called the navigation bar. Navigation bar basically just controls how we navigate around documents, um, different modes documents can be in, page functions, page size, scale, things like that. So if I uh, look at the buttons on the left here, got the split document setting, so I can split a document vertically or horizontally, so I can look at things side by side um, or anything like that. They should synchronize Zoom as well by default. Um, if I hit this button on the left here, unsplit, it goes back to normal. The next two buttons are the different modes that your documents can be in. Um, you've got one full page and scrolling pages. One full page, um, if I scroll the mouse wheel, I zoom in and out of the document, and scrolling pages, I will scroll down the document. So generally when we're working with drawings, you wanna be in one full page, it makes it a lot easier to navigate around your drawing, move it around and everything like that. Um, if you're looking at like text documents, a contract or schedules, or things like that that you need to read, if you go into scrolling pages, obviously it makes it a bit easier to scroll down the document so you can read it. So pretty much everything we're gonna to do today will be in one full page, we're gonna be working with drawings. So um, the next button's on the uh, toolbar here are the different mouse functions that we have. So we've got pan, select, select text, and the zoom tool. If I'm in pan, if I left click and hold, I pan around the document. If I uh, scroll the mouse wheel, I'll zoom in and out. If I right click and hold, I can draw a selection window, which will select markups that I put on the drawing. So if I put something on here, for example, and I right click and hold, it selects that markup. Um, doesn't select anything in your drawing though. Um, and then if I click and hold the mouse wheel, I can also pan with that. It's a really good tip and habit to be in to try and use the mouse wheel to pan um, instead of the left click. The reason is, is if I go to activate a tool, obviously if I left click, I'm going to draw the tool. But if I click and hold the mouse wheel, I can pan and move around my drawing without deactivating a tool. So I can do my cloud here, I can move over here, do my cloud again. Um, it's just a really nice habit to be in. Um, you'll notice as well when I do use tools as well, they're continuously being reused. The reason is because I have this reuse tools function turned on down in the status bar. So uh, what that does is it just allows you to continuously reuse a tool and then you just hit escape to get out of it and it deactivates the tool. Um, so yeah, with the mouse functions, uh, basically you can cover all of the different ones in pan by using your different mouse buttons instead of having to switch between all the functions, except for select text. If you do need to select text, you've got to switch to that tool. Um, selecting text is a bit of an interesting function in Bluebeam, or generally just in PDFs because of the way they work. Um, you'll find that as you go to select text like I'm doing here, if I move slightly it selects half the text on the drawing. Um, to get around that, the best way to do it is to uh, hold shift and it'll allow me to draw a box around what I'm selecting instead of just selecting everything. So it'll only select what's inside that box. Cool, and then the next buttons, we've just got basic page functions, next page, previous page, um, first page and last page of the document, and then we've got previous view and next view. What those ones do um, is if I've created links in my document, which we're gonna touch on a little bit later, um, they will allow me to go back and forward. So let's say I switch pages, for example, I go to page six. If I hit this previous view, it takes me back to where I was before. 
and same with next view takes me back to where I just went. So just kind of like back and forward buttons on your web browser and allow you to just navigate around your document. Um, then in the bottom corner, we just got our page size and scale if there's a scale set for the drawings as well. Cool. And so just the last quick little navigation tip uh, to help you sort of navigate around documents as well. Um, by default, most documents will be labeled one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like this one here. It's 32 different pages in this set. Obviously, it's very difficult for us to find what drawings we need. We'd have to look through, find the, the sections. OK, cool. This is drawing 8.2. It's got the ones I need, but it's a little bit of effort to try and find it and takes a bit of time. We want to try and eliminate as many of these time taking tasks as possible. So um, what I can do is use some information from my drawing in the title block, for example. Um, to set page labels, which allow me to navigate through a lot easier. So if I go to this button up the top here in the thumbnails panel, which is the one that looks like four little squares and has all of our pages in it, um, looks like half a rectangle with a sun underneath it. If I click that one there and go by page region and then select, what it wants me to do is select something from the drawing. So I'm just going to pick my sheet number first. And it shows me that that's region one and that's a preview of what it's going to pick up. I'm going to add a second region as well. You can add as many regions as you need to. I just put something in between it so it separates them like a dash, for example. Hit add down here, and then I've got to select my second region as well. You notice as well when I do this, I make the boxes a little bit bigger than what I'm picking up. The reason is, is if the text gets longer or bigger or like the sheet number gets longer, for example, you want to make sure you encapsulate it across the whole document. So um, shows me that's my region one and region two, and that's what it's going to look like as a preview. I just hit OK there, and then I want my page range is 1 to 32, so it's going to do it for all the pages. Hit OK, and what it does is it just goes through every page in the document, finds that section on the drawing from the title block, and picks up the text that's in there and relabels all of the documents. So now I can see and navigate through this a lot easier. Um, I can see what my drawing numbers are and what all the drawings are instead of having to look through and find them individually. Um, you'll notice the first page, it's just labeled it as a dash. Um, the reason is it's because that title block isn't there because it's just the cover page. So if you need to re manually relabel one, you just double click into it and then relabel it. Cool. So that's just some quick navigation tips. Um, let's go into some of the actual markup tools and measurement tools. So I'm just going to close down this document. Up something else. So um, all the markup tools or the basic kind of annotation markup tools generally sit in the uh, toolbar on the right hand side. You've got a few different sort of drawing tools down here as well. Um, in here, we've got things like text box, highlighter, pen tool, the cloud plus, which is the combination of a cloud and a call out. We've got stamps. Um, in stamps, you can have some pretty basic ones or you can create some pretty complex ones using JavaScript and things like that. So it pops up a window, um, allows you to select options and things like that. Um, We've got image tools, we've got a snapshot tool, um, and whatever else you want to turn on in here as well. Um, under tools and then markup, you've also got some more functions in here as well if you don't see them in your toolbars. So some of the just little tips that we can do. So if I draw a text box, for example, put some text in it, and then I hit escape, you'll notice that the text box resizes automatically to the size of the text. The reason it does that, if I go to preferences in here under review, and then I go to tools and then markup. I have this setting turned on here, auto size text box and call out markups. So what that means is yeah, for any call out or text box, it's just gonna auto size the text box to the size of the text once I finish writing the text. Just keeps things a little bit cleaner and a little bit neater on your drawings basically. Um, when I select a tool or use any kind of tool, um, I've got the properties panel on the right hand side here, and I've also got the properties toolbar, which pops up up the top here underneath the toolbars that I have turned on up there. Um, the toolbar is just kind of a simplified version of um, the panel, basically. So it's just a little bit quicker and easier to work with. Um, just has the quick properties that you can see. So um, I can customize things in here. I can also use some of the tools to sort of resize things and, and um, yeah, play with it that way. So if I hit this little A here um, with the arrows pointing outwards, and then I click and drag my control points to the text box, you'll see the text obviously gets bigger with the size of the text box. Um, if I turn that back off and I hit this one with the arrows pointing inwards, 
that's the auto size text box function. So similar to that automatic one that I turned on as part of the settings, this is the manual way of doing it. So um, it just automatically sizes the text box to the size of the text again. Unfortunately, you can't use that one whilst the auto size text is turned on. It doesn't let you. So um, you've got to turn that off and then auto size the text box again. Um, with the text box, if I right click it, I can add a leader line to it, turns it into a call out. I can add as many leaders as I want to. Um, they will automatically just point off in whatever direction uh, that uh, it goes into. Um, if I need to delete a leader, I just right click it and delete the leader line. Um, whichever leader line you're actually right clicking as well is the one that will get deleted. And it goes back to being a text box for me. Um, same with a call out. I draw my call out, put some text in it, see the text box automatically resizes to the size of the text again. I can still add and delete leaders as well. The same, just right click and delete or add as I want to, and it will also go down to a text box as well. Those two kind of become interchangeable. Um, Cloud Plus is an incredibly useful function. So Cloud Plus basically is a combination of those two tools. So it allows us to highlight something and actually have a call out straight attached to it. So Cloud Plus is this one here, shortcut is K. Um, if I click and hold over something, it allows me to draw my cloud and then click to place my call out, put my text in there. Again, you'll see the text is over here. The size of the text box is a bit white. As I hit escape, it auto sizes again to the size of the text and aligns it with the call out. Can customize things like this um, so I can in the properties you'll see um, as the tool gets more complex it has different sections in the properties which does make the toolbar a little bit more challenging to work with the more complex the tool is because this has obviously got the cloud it's also got the call out um, and then the text properties as well so you'll see in the toolbar you've got a little cloud here all of these properties here are to do with the cloud up until this little call out symbol and then everything else here is to do with the call out so they're kind of like a group basically um, and you've got different properties as part of it so I can customize for example the line if i want to make the line say blue i can put a fill color into it i can make it highlight which basically just highlights and shows us what's underneath it kind of changes the opacity without changing the opacity you can change things like the fill opacity as well which is this one here and it gets a little bit lighter as well um, then the call out i can change the line of that as well if i want to text if i go down here is a little bit further down i've got those auto size functions here as well any kind of call out or text box will have those auto size functions um, i could put a fill color behind my call out make my text blue for example put a line around it which will be here somewhere Sure where that line is it's gone oh yeah this point there we go put a line around my text box kind of as you put a line obviously it reshapes it so i can just hit that auto size again and it will auto size to the text so i get my call out there um obviously we don't want to have to do the like customization every time we use a call out if we want that to be our default there's a couple of ways we could do this or we can either make it our default or we can save it to be able to reuse it later so if i go into the tool at the top here um i've got this little button here i can set that as my default from the properties here i can also do it from the bottom of the properties panel down here set as default or i could add it to my tool chest the tool chest is this little toolbox icon um, and it basically allows us to build libraries of tools whether it's symbols um, annotation tools measurement tools we can build any kind of library we want um, They've also just added uh, with the latest update, review 21.2, this search function. So I can search for tools in here now as well, um, which is really cool. So the sort of new thing as you build obviously big libraries of tools, um, the more tools you have in there, the harder it is to find things. So um, as you search for things in here, it will make your life a lot easier to find things. Cool. Um, so to create a tool set, I just go to tool chest up here, manage tool sets, and then I can go to add. Call it whatever I want to. I'll just call this webinar. Say yes. Cool. And it pops up as a blank tool set. I want to add the tool to the tool set. Just go right click it, add to tool set, and add it to my webinar one. Or I can do it from here, or I can do it from up here as well. A few different spots you can do it from. Um, there's two different modes that a tool can be in in a tool set. So one's called drawing mode and one's called properties mode. Yeah, basically, uh, by default, they'll save into uh, drawing mode normally. 
as I click and place it, it draws exactly the same as how it was saved. Um, if I want to be able to draw it with different shape and size and text, except keep the same properties, I just double click it and it switches into properties mode. You'll notice that the symbol has changed slightly in there. I'm just going to collapse all these so that it's up to the top. When I click that, it allows me to draw the tool with different shape and size and different text. Another new cool feature that's just been added in the latest update as well, if I right click a markup now, I can actually hide an individual markup. So I can just hide that markup um, and it gets rid of it for me. Seems to go like that, yep. And if I want to hide this one, I can hide that one. Um, it shows me up the top here um, that they're hidden. So if I hover over, it brings them back up. And if I click that, it turns the hiding off. So it just unhides them for you. Cool, uh, tool sets can also be shared the same as uh, profiles as well, a similar kind of window that we deal with with profiles. I select the one I want, export it, save it to somewhere that everyone can access it. Um, if you do want to work with shared tool sets across the business as well, you can put them in a shared drive um, and instead of creating them or importing them, you go to add up here and add an existing tool set from its path. And if you have it on a shared drive, um, it'll allow you to bring that tool set in there, but it also keep the tool set in its existing path. Um, what that means is that um, it basically, <coughs> it's, it's, it's read only generally, unless um, uh, you unlock it and then it allows you to edit it, but it allows you to kind of work with shared tool sets and it allows people to add tools as you need to and everything like that as well. Cool, so that's the tool sets. Um, just gonna quickly touch on some tips with measurement tools and things like that. So. I just get rid of these. So everything to do with measurement tools, um, there's a few different tools that sit on the right hand side here, um, but we usually do things from the measurements panel. Measurements panel contains all of your measurement tools up the top here, um, has all the things like the calibration settings, um, how we can calibrate our drawing, set scales, and also has things like measurement properties so we can label things properly. We can also create viewports in here as well. So, um, First thing we need to do is make sure we calibrate our drawing. Um, there's two different ways that we can go about calibrating. We can either use a preset scale if we know have a predefined scale, um, or we can use an existing measurement and uh, calibrate to that measurement. So in this drawing, we have a scale that says it's one to 100, so we can use that scale. Um, I don't have any existing measurements, so I can't set anything to that. But if we had a known dimension in here, let's say we knew how wide this office was, for example, we could hit calibrate here. <coughs> and it will ask us to select two points of a known dimension to calibrate our measurement tools. Hit OK there, and I would just select the first point. If I hold Shift, uh, whenever I'm doing any kind of line, it will hold a dead straight line, it snaps orthogonally at 45, 90, or 180, and then it will pick up the next point for me there as well, and I click that one, and then I would just tell it what this uh, was. So let's say, for example, I knew that this was 3.3 meters, I could tell it that's 3.3 meters, um, and I can do that for multiple pages, or I could just do it for the current page. This document only has one page, so it's only gonna let me do it for one. Right here, apply scale, and that would calibrate the drawing for me. Um, I don't know if that's a correct scale or not, so in this case, I have a preset scale, which means I'm gonna go to preset here, and I'm just gonna set this as one to 100. Um, there is a few different preset built-in ones, and then you can also create your own presets as well so that you can select those. The way to create a preset scale, you go to this custom here, um, set the units as the same. doesn't matter what units, it just needs to be the same units. And then you can set it in here. So if you want it to be 1 to 80, for example, just set 1 as the first one and 80 as the second one. And that will give you a scale of 1 to 80. And then you can add that to your preset scales there. Uh, but yeah, like I said, this one's 1 to 100. So we're going to use that. Um, whenever you're using measurement tools, um, it's really important to label things and make sure um, that you're keeping things organized. The reason is, is because everything that you do is tracked um, in terms of like your markups list down the bottom here. So if we don't label things properly, the information becomes really useless. So as I do measurements, let's say, for example, I do an area measurement, just click and drag around this office. Uh, I just want to make sure that I label things. Obviously, I didn't label that there, so I can label it after I've done it. So I'm going to call this, uh, let's say, depends on, on sort of how you're doing things and how you label it, but um, I'm just going to call this flooring. And then this is office one, for example. 
So you'll see the reason we do that as we go into the markups list, everything gets labeled in here. There's different columns that come on in here, can turn on my label um, and everything like that. Um, if we don't label things in here, this data becomes pretty useless because we don't sort of know what anything is. Everything's just labeled area measurement. Um, it's one of the biggest tips we can give you is label everything that you do. Um, if you are reusing things, so for example, let's say I'm often measuring my flooring, I can right click this and I can add this to my tool chest. I could set different colors and things like that. Double click this to put it in properties mode. And then I can see this is my flooring measurement click around these points and get this one here as well. Cool. Um, when you do a measurement, if you want to move this label, if you hold shift, you can click and drag that label without moving the measurement. If I get it right, there we go. Um, so I can move that label to be somewhere where I can actually see it. This one obviously is Office 2, so I'm just going to relabel that as Office 2. You could also do that in the tool set as well before you use it. If you just double click into the label here, say I've got Office 3 now, let's just, or I could even label this boardroom, for example. And then as I go to use it, it will be already pre labeled as boardroom for me. In the markups list, as I start adding these in here, if I turn on the measurements column, you should be able to see. The measurements for all of my um, things here, as I order it by flooring, it groups them all as flooring and it also gives me a total measurement up the top there as well. Um, we can export this markup list into a CSV or into a PDF, which gives us a bit of a summary of um, everything that we've done there. Cool. So yeah, the biggest tips for measurements would just be to make sure you label everything and save things that you're going to reuse. The idea would be to categorize it um, into different sort of things you use. If you're doing takeoffs, for example, you might categorize it into the different categories of things that you're taking off, depending on what your discipline is. Um, but yeah, the idea is to make sure you try and save things and reuse things as much as possible. Um, the more you can do that, the less time you'll spend customizing things and the more organized your markup list will be as well. Cool. So. Last thing on measurements as well, um, calibrating things across where you have different scales. So let me just open up something else. Uh, I'm just going to close this one down. Cool. So I've got a drawing here uh, which has uh, different scales um, across different sections of these elevations. So um, the way we can go about setting these different scales, so these are all 1 to 100. So I could either set them all individually as their sections as different viewports, or I could just set all of those as 1 to 100. Um, but if I go to the measurements panel, down the bottom here, we've got this section that says viewports. Um, every now and then you'll get a drawing that opens up and it says this document has untitled viewports. Um, do, do you want to remove them? Always well, so you can hit yes on that um, and it just gets rid of them. Sometimes when you generate drawings from AutoCAD, it puts an untitled viewport across it. It just messes with all your measurements because the scale isn't set in it. Um, and when you set the scale in your drawing, it's not set in the viewport. So um, just gets rid of them. But if I want to add a viewport, I just hit here and then select a region to define, define the viewport. I just left click and hold across the section. Um, I should generally, probably should do it in each elevation. So then I would just label it. I want to set that as 1 to 100, as it says there. And I'm going to label this as south rear elevation. And that sets that section as that viewport. And then if I want to add a second one, obviously you probably do it for all of them, but I'm just going to uh, do it for this one here, which is a different scale. Set that as 1 to 200, and this is heritage site line elevation. Hit apply. And so what that does is it basically allows me to do, take different measurements in those different sections, let's say do a length measurement over here. And measurements at similar size you should see that they're very different in terms of uh, what the measurement value is. So although those are quite similar size, um, that one's 19.73, that one's 9.68. So it allows you to have those different scales um, across your drawings um, in elevation drawings where it's required. Cool, so that's it for the measurements. Um, Next thing we're going to talk about quickly is just a little bit about overlaying and comparing documents. I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly and then 
um, we'll do that hyperlinking and then we'll open it up for questions if anyone has any. Cool. So we've got two drawings here. Um, one's a revision of the other. It's got some minor changes, um, some things like some rooms have been added into it. Um, it's a couple of minor changes that are a little bit difficult to see. Um, we've got two functions for comparing drawings in Bluebeam. We've got overlay and we've got compare. So I'm going to just use this as a little opportunity to show you a tip that you can use them together. So um, under document up the top here, we've got overlay pages and we've got compare documents. So um, on their own, they're good for different things. So overlay, obviously it's going to overlay the two together. So it's going to put one in one color, one in another color, drop them on top of each other. Compare, what it does is puts a cloud around everything that's changed, brings it up next to the original. So you can see sort of what's in the clouds versus what was in the original um, or what's not in the clouds if it's disappeared. Um, both have their advantages, both have their disadvantages. So um, obviously when you put clouds on something, it becomes a markup, which means it's tracked in the markup list, which means we can create a report of it. Um, but the overlay obviously doesn't give us that because it's not giving us markups, it's just putting the, the content on top of each other. So um, using them together can kind of combine the best of both worlds. So if I go to overlay pages here, um, this is the new overlay window. There is some new functions that got added in in the last update not too long ago um, where they've sort of revamped this window. If you've used this in the past, it was a little gray window and it was kind of pretty useless and awful to use, but um, it adds in the first file that I'm looking at and then I can add in the open file as the other one. Um, it's going to put the one I'm looking at first in red and then it's going to put the second one I add in in green. Generally, I would recommend to leave them as red and green and you generally would want the original to be in red and the revised file to be in green. It's just a good association that anything that's green is something that's added, anything that's taken away is red. And then everything that's the same will be black. So in the past, we had to manually align things if the content was out of line. We didn't get this preview either in the past, so this is quite nice. Um, you'll see quite quickly in here, if uh, the content's out of line, so for example, uh, pages are different size or uh, content's moved a center on the page, centimeter on the page, for example, um, you can now automatically align them as well. So basically, if you hit that auto align, it uses AI and it automatically aligns them to, to, to suit each other. Um, these are already in alignment, so I don't need to do anything to do with the alignment. Um, I just hit OK and it creates this overlay file for me shows me everything that has been added as green, everything that's taken away as red, and everything that's the same is black. So we can see some of the things that were really difficult to see in the start, probably wouldn't have noticed was things like that building was extended there. Um, got some doorways and a wall added here as well. See all the section markers and stuff like that were taken away. Um, there's a doorway that was added there as well. So yeah, um, if I save that overlay file, let's just save it into my webinar file. Cool. Save it in here. Um, then I can use that to do a compare documents um, with the original file. So if I do the compare documents now, I want the uh, original file to be document A and I want the revised file to be document B as uh, overlay. Um, again, I can use that auto align function if I need to. I don't need to with these ones, they're all the same. The output, it's going to apply um, the clouds to a new copy of the revised page, so a new copy of the overlay file. Um, it's going to output it to this file, which I'm going to change to be a file that I'm working in. You would probably generally put this in your project file um, if you were doing this in a live example. And then I'm just going to hit OK. What it does, puts a cloud around everything that's changed, brings it up next to each other in split screen, um, which it will do when we normally compare revisions as well. Um, so it allows us to see sort of what's been added and what's been taken away. The cool thing about doing this with the overlay file is we can see everything that's clouded red was something taken away and everything that's clouded green as something that was added. Um, what it means is if I go to export this as a report, say I close this file down because I don't really need that open anymore. If I go to export this as a report from my markups list, um, I can see everything that's added and taken away from here. So I could just, by default, everything's locked as I uh, do this. So if I select all, control A, and right click and lock, and unlock everything there, and I can just get rid of a couple of things that I don't really need. The date that's changed in there, cool. 
if I go into my markup system here, you'll see everything is tracked as what's called, a, it's just called a difference basically. Um, I can turn off all the columns in here. So I'm just going to leave on, uh, let's just leave on date, author, uh, subject, and comments. And then I can put comments against some of them. Generally, obviously, you would probably put them against all of them if you were doing this in a live example, but I'm just going to do a couple of, say, some rooms added. Building was extended here. We could obviously go through and do it all. I'm just going to do the two for now. Um, I can export this into a PDF summary. PDF summary just gives me like a flow kind of breakdown of all the different uh, markups that are in there and a little thumbnail image of um, what it's going to be. And if I append and hyperlink it to the current PDF, it just adds it to the bottom of this file as well. So hit OK, processes the report. Cool. And it looks something like this. So we get a breakdown of each little difference. It has a little thumbnail, which is hyperlinked to where it is in the drawing as well. When I click that, it takes me to it. Previous view, it takes me back. Um, and if I scroll through here, I should be able to find one that's got the comments. Any comments I put in there, sit on the right-hand side there. And it just gives me a nice breakdown and report of um, everything that was in this drawing. Again, the images take me to where they were as well. Cool, so that's the overlay and compare. Really useful function. Um, using them together makes that so much more powerful. If you just wanted to see the changes for a visual purpose, the overlay is awesome. Um, the compare just has that issue of it not showing you what's been taken away unless you're looking at the original next to it, so it just takes a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, using them together just makes that really powerful, especially if you export it and use the reports as well. Cool, so the last thing we're gonna go through is batch hyperlinking. So this is uh, something that used to only be in the extreme version, but I believe it's in all the versions now, potentially, may not be, but most people have complete these days if you've transitioned from the old uh, model anyway as well. So have to check that, whether it's in all the versions. I think I did before, but I can't 100% remember. So what we're going to do here basically is uh, create some links based on things like these section markers so that these can take us to their pages. You'll see in here that this actually already has one here. So I click that and it takes me to the correct page. Um, how do we create those? Obviously, if we had to go through each of those manually, it would be a bit of a nightmare. So what I'm going to do is just delete all of the links on here and show you how to create them. Cool. So. How do we create those? If I go to batch up here and link and go to new, I'm going to add the open file into here. So it's just going to add this file that I'm working on, then hit next. Um, what I've got to do is I've got to tell it what it's going to search for. So generally, I'm going to search for the drawing number, which is what I'm creating links for here for drawing numbers that it finds throughout the, the drawings. So go to page region here and then select. Same as how we did it when I did the uh, page labels at the start, just left click and hold around sheet title, sheet number, sorry. Again, making it a bit wider in case that number gets longer, more digits, for example. Hit OK, this time I'm just gonna pick up that one region. I don't wanna pick up anything else. And then I hit generate here. What it does is it just goes through each page again, similar to when we did the page labels and picks up all of those. If you had already set the page labels just as those uh, sheet numbers, you could just use the page labels to generate these sheet search terms as well. Um, once I've got all those search terms, basically what I'm doing here is I'm telling it to search through the drawings and try and find this anywhere in the drawings. And then it's going to create a link over that to whatever page it's found this search term on. So I hit run. And it goes through, finds them all, creates a link quite quickly. And it tells me it's created 74 hyperlinks. Um, nothing was skipped. Nothing couldn't be found. Hit finish and close. And then if I go and find one of those section markers again, Go down here, you should see now it's got that link again. That takes me to the correct page, A3.02. Uh, if I look at on the first page as well, in this little contents page here, all of these have now been created links as well, which takes me to the correct pages. It's a really, really useful tool to sort of help you navigate documents as well. Um, going to check when we're in the question and answer phase. Um, whether that's in every version or if it's just incomplete, I need to confirm that. So, um, but yeah, really useful tool to help you sort of navigate around documents. So that's it for the tips and tricks section of today. I'm going to open it up if anyone has any questions. Just going to change the settings so that 
and I can unmute if there has been any questions. Sec. Cool. Everyone should now have access to unmute themselves. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, while we do have any questions, there's a couple of links on the screen there just for our Facebook and uh, LinkedIn pages. Um, feel free to check those out. We do post things quite regularly, different content and tips and tricks and things like that on there. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. Or if you're not comfortable talking, you can pop them in the chat as well and we can get to them. Uh, was there any questions as we went through at all as well? Good, Alex. Can I jump in there? Yeah. How are you going? I just missed um, how you generate the report from your markups list. Can you just show me quickly sure. where you did that? Sure. No Please. worries. Okay. I'll just do it from this document just as an example. Sure. But I'll just put a couple of markups on there. So when you do the markups this year, you've got this little uh, button here. It's like a square with an arrow pointing out of it. So it's called summary. Um, there's different options for the different summaries. The CSV summary will give you like an Excel summary, very similar to what it looks like in here. And then the PDF summary is the one I just did with the comparison. So um, thank you. Different That's options. it. Yep. Cool. No worries. Thanks, Owen. Um, I had a question. There, yeah. You mentioned some shortcuts as well. Yep. Is there a way to see some of those shortcuts or? list of those shortcuts yes there is so there's a couple of different places you can get them under the help menu under here uh you've got the keyboard shortcuts guide uh which will bring up a guide that has all the different keyboard shortcuts in them um has a few little navigation tips things like those mouse button um things that i mentioned at the start as well are in here uh so it's just a couple of little uh tips and tricks that go in there as well but yeah there's a breakdown of all of these uh, shortcuts in here you can also customize your keyboard shortcuts if you've got uh, other products you use that have similar kind of functions that have different shortcuts you go to keyboard shortcuts in here just select the tool you want and you can reassign the shortcut to something different in here as well if you need to oh cool. it's just a couple of uh, questions coming in the chat from James, uh, how do you switch on and off the markups list? There's a couple of different ways you can access your markups list. Um, the three little lines down the bottom here, markups, or if there is another symbol down the bottom here as well, um, you will uh, be able to bring it up here. There's, depending on what you've used last is what we'll show there. But um, yeah, you just select that and it'll come up and down. Or if you hover down the bottom here, this little blue line pops up and you can click and drag it up and down as well. Question from Jeannie, how to control image size and file size. Uh, image sizes are just based on what the size of the image is. So if you're bringing an image into a drawing, uh, depending on what how what the quality of the image is and how big it is, is depending on how it will be when it brings in. The more images you put in a drawing or the more images you have in your file, obviously the, the file size is going to get bigger. Images are very heavy content. Um, if you are finding they're getting too big, uh, particularly if the images are actually in the PDF content as well, you can reduce file size. You've got a document up here, reduce file size, um, and you can balance your quality versus compression. The more compression, the less um, image quality will be uh, kept, the more quality you go for, higher image quality but less compression. Um, and you can do a preset under edit in here as well. Um, you can change different kind of uh, settings for what you are uh, reducing file size in here as well, depending on what you want to drop and things like that. And yeah, there's a few different settings, but I wouldn't, if you're not sure what all of these things mean and everything like that, I wouldn't mess with this too much. I'd probably just use the preset one up the top here. Question from Mike. Show us how to save markups to a layer and then move the layer to another background. Are you able to elaborate what you mean by move? Do you mean moving it to another page, Mike? Uh, 
um, I think I think if that's what you mean, like I'll show you what I mean by that. So if you if you combine, so let's say we add layers into here. Uh, let's go to layers here. So layers basically allows to to assign markups to different layers. There's some some benefits to it, which is really cool. It allows us to turn on and off different layers, so we can sort of categorize our markups, especially as your markup uh, get your drawings get quite busy with markups. So yeah, add one. I'll just call this layer one. It's my examples, and then layer two. Oops, supposed to be two. Let's just rename that. Cool. Um, I can assign these markups to those layers. Going to layer up here. The three asked it What looked at your own porch? Assign this one to the layer. It can do Cool. Um, so I can turn these layers on and off, which is cool. Um, if I wanted to move these to another one, you can't, I think you can export the layer. Uh, export layer to page which will basically allow me to export that to its own page and it just exports those markups um, probably a better way though to move it to if you wanted to move it to a different just a new let's say a new pdf for example let's assume this is a different drawing um, i would just isolate the layer that i want to move let's say it's layer two for example and i would just select the markups there because it's only going to let me select anything that's on there. I will just copy those or control C. So yeah, right click and copy and then go across to the new page. If it's the same size page, uh, if you go to uh, edit, you've got paste in place or control shift B is the, the shortcut and that will paste that markup in the same location. The different size pages. So it's not going to do it to the same size page. It'll look a little bit better. Uh, new PDF. Six two five zero six six point eight. Cool. That was supposed to be portrait. Sorry, landscape. Um, okay, one zero six six point eight, and then seven six two. Cool. Okay. So now if I do that again, Control C that, and then I can do Control Shift B and paste that uh, markup in the same location. That's a better way to move them to different um, different things. And when you paste it as well, it brings its layer assignment across as well. Same as if you save a if you save a markup to a tool set with its layer assignment um, already pre-assigned to it, it will keep that layer assignment. And then when you use it from the tool chest on a new document, it brings that layer straight into the document for you. So if I add that into webinar, for example, and then I go to another new PDF. Currently, there is no layers in this PDF, right? Once I place that markup, that layer will automatically get brought into this document as well. Does that answer your question, Mike? And sorry if it didn't, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Um, I think Ty's just responded to David's question about assigning documents. Um, if anyone wants to have a read through there, basically it's an issue where um, if you combine multiple signed PDFs, the digital signatures get removed. Um, it, yeah, it's it's just it will invalidate the signatures. Signatures are designed to certify a document. As soon as you make changes, it's going to basically remove the signatures. Anyone else have any other questions? Uh, I'm not sure um, if you mentioned with the scale. Yep. What if you don't have a scale uh, explicitly showed? Um, on the document, how would you yeah. go about finding did, it? Did mention it briefly. So, if you don't have a predefined scale, like in, for example, this one is one to one ninety-two. Generally, what you need is some kind of known dimension 
if your drawing has dimensions, awesome. Um, if your drawing doesn't have dimensions, you might know like the size of a toilet, for example, or um, the size of a particular room. Uh, usually like your fixtures you might have from a specification or something like that maybe, which might tell you the size. Um, and you would just need to calibrate to that known dimension by going to calibrate, selecting the two points of the known dimension. Um, and then yeah, it'll, it'll basically pick up the scale based on that. A uh, question from Anita, can you customize colors for markups to your brand colors? Yes, you can. So if you have specific colors uh, that you want to use on a drawing, so let's say I go to do a cloud, for example, and I just want to change the color. I go to the properties panel in here and I want to change my line color. So these are the default colors, right? Um, but if I hit this little arrow down the bottom here, it expands and I can actually use color codes. So I can use the hash keys um, for those different colors. So yes, if you've got specific brand colors that you have and you know the codes for them, um, then yeah, uh, it, it will bring it in there as well. Uh, James just asked as well if there is a recording. Um, yes, there will be a recording. Uh, I've recorded this and we'll just process it. We'll post it on YouTube and we'll send it out to everyone who registered. So James, you should get a link to it, which you can send out to your team as well, um, which will be, they'll be more than welcome to watch it. Um, we do run these different webinars throughout the year as well. I'm not 100% sure on when the next one is, sorry, but, um, but we do run them on different topics as well. Sometimes we do more workflow boost based ones. Um, if you do have any specific topic requests, please reach out to me. I'm always open to ideas for different webinars and different things that we can do. So um, yes, definitely we do do more of them and yeah, we'll send out the recording. Another question from Junie, can two measurements in two scales in one page? Um, I'm going to assume you mean two different, having two different scales in one page. Is, is that right, Junie? If you can clarify for me. So if you've got two different scales on the same page, like in this example that I showed. Yeah, cool, no worries. So in that case, the I think I showed this quickly um, when we looked at the measurement section, um, is using viewports. So uh, let me just find in this drawing, it's easy. Uh, let's say for example, these two sections, I don't think I have two sections that have different scales on the same page in this set of drawings, uh, but let's just imagine that the uh, scale for this one, let's say that this is one to 100, uh, let's just imagine that by doing some pretty funky editing. Uh, let's just edit some text. So let's imagine this scale here is actually 1 to 100. And then uh, this one here is 1 to 200. So the way to do this, we set viewports. So uh, if I go to the measurements panel in here, I can set uh, viewports in here. I'm just going to delete all of these existing ones in here and then I'm going to add my own. So I hit this little plus here, ask me to select a region to define a viewport. I just left click and hold around this section on the drawing and then I'd set that as whatever the scale is here and I would make sure I label this correctly which was some kind of elevation let's just say it's elevation one, for example. Um, so that's one to 100, I hit apply there, and that sets the scale for that section as one to 100. And then if I go to the plus again, I can define my second one, which will be this one here. And this one is one to 200. So I just change that scale to one to 200. And then I uh, change the label again. This one would be, let's just say it's elevation two, for example, and hit apply. And then, uh, yeah. Any measurements I do in those sections will be based on the scales that I've set for those sections. So you can see as I try to do measurements, the viewports highlight blue. It's just showing you that there's a viewport over that section. Um, even if I set the scale of the drawing to be uh, something different, let's say I go preset in here and let's say I just set this to 1 to 10, for example, um, measurements in those sections will be whatever I set in there. So that's 1 to 100, that's 1 to 200, and then out here it's 1 to 10. So if I do measurement in here, very different sort of measurements. Cool. Any other questions? Just while I'm waiting, if there's any other questions, I'll just bring up this again. Um, if anyone has any issues with Bluebeam 
and needs help or just has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email is just alex at advancedspatial.com.au um, or yeah, you can reach out to support at advancedspatial.com.au. Um, if we aren't currently your partner, obviously a lot of you will, will be, um, but if you, we aren't currently your partner, we may need to update your reseller of record um, to be able to help. Um, but yeah, to, just depending on what it is. Going to check as well, just quickly, on what plan that batch hyperlink is included in. Okay, so that batch hyperlinking uh, section that I showed at the end is only available in the complete plan. So if you don't have complete, then yeah, you would need to upgrade to that. Question from Trevor. We use Revit and I mark up in Bluebeam and it goes back to be edited in Revit. Do advanced users actually finish in Bluebeam? No, is the answer to that. Um, Bluebeam's not a drawing tool. It's it's a it's a PDF markup tool. You can do some basic drawing in a PDF if you needed to make some minor modifications and things like that. But it's not it's not a geometric sort of drawing program. It's nowhere near as advanced as something like Revit, for example, which is obviously a three D modeling tool. Um, the, once you sort of convert something from a drawing or a model into a PDF, it becomes what's called a dumb drawing. It takes all the the metadata out of it. It takes all, all the sort of background information. Um, Bluebeam is designed for what you said to do the markups for it to go back to be edited in Revit. Um, it just has some really advanced markup tools that allow you to do some really cool things, but it's not designed to be the drawing tool, no. In saying that, I have seen some people do some preliminary drawings in Bluebeam, but yeah, it's not something that I would recommend as to be a finished product, definitely not. No worries, Trevor. Any other questions from anyone? Cool, We've just gone over 10 o'clock. So there's no more questions. We'll probably finish up. Um, if anyone does have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Um, like I said, you could reach out to myself or the support email um, or give us a call as well and someone will be able to help you. Um, we will uh, send out a link to the recording for this um, once it's processed and ready to go. So keep an eye out for that if you do want to go back over anything. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out anytime if anyone has any questions. And thank you very much for attending the session today. Bye, everyone.